Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Had to check. Um, just to say that uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here, and there's nowhere in the world, and I go all over the world, where I find such depth of praise. So just thank you for always inviting me to that praise, because it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I was in New York, and um, I was at St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is quite a big church, and the cardinal, the old cardinal, Cardinal O'Connor, was giving his talk, and he was telling about three young boys of about 14 who decided to have a laugh at the priest's expense. So they, they decided to make up the worst confessions they could think of. So the first boy goes in, and he tells the priest how he had been really bad, he had stolen, he had beaten up people, and the priest was a bit suspicious, but he wasn't too sure whether he was telling the truth or not, so he got away with it. The second guy goes in, and he tells him how he's been robbing people, and he actually said that he nearly killed someone, and the priest is becoming more suspicious, but he thinks maybe it's true, so he gives him his absolution, off he goes. The third one comes in, and he just goes a bit too far, and the priest really realises that these three kids are just winding him up. And he said, I want you to go and do something for me. I want you to go out in that church, and I want you to kneel down at the life-size crucifix, and I want you to look at Jesus on that cross, and I want you to say, I couldn't care less that you died for me. So the kid goes out and he kneels down at the cross and he looks at the crucifix and he looks at Jesus' face and he says, I, and he burst into tears. And Cardinal O'Connor said, that young boy was me. That young boy was me. I think that when we're faced with what Christ is, when we're faced with what Christ does for us, when we're faced with what Christ wants from us, that's when we find that pearl of great price. You know, there's a, a lovely story of a man who's walking past this jeweler's, and in the jeweler's shop, in the window, he sees this pearl, and he's absolutely transfixed by this pearl, and eventually builds up enough courage, and he goes in the jeweler's shop, and he actually is amazed to see the person behind the counter is Jesus. And he says, Jesus, could I have a look at that pearl in the window? And Jesus says, yes, but it's very expensive. So anyhow, Jesus brings out the pearl, and as he places it in this man's hand, everything this man has ever dreamt of, everything this man has ever wanted, is fulfilled in this pearl. And as Jesus takes it out of his hand, it all leaves him. And he says, I must have that pearl. How much does it cost? And Jesus looked at him and he said, what have you got? And he said, well, I've got $20. He said, well, give me your $20. And he said, but then how will I get a cab home? And he said, oh, you've got a home. Give me your home. And he says, but then where will my wife live? Ah, oh, you've got a wife. Give me your wife. But then who will look after the children? Ah, oh, you've got a children. Give me your children. And he says, but who will take the dog out? Ah, oh, you've got a dog. No, no, not the dog. <laughs> I'm just making a joke. <laughs> we get a bit screwed up with dogs and animals, in my opinion. Anyway, he actually gives Jesus everything he has. There's nothing else in his life he hasn't gave him. And in exchange, Jesus places this pearl in his hand. And as he's walking out, even though he's fulfilled, there was a great cost involved. And just about when he's about to leave the door, Jesus says, one moment, here's your $20 back. But remember they're mine. I'm just lending it to you. Here's your wife back. But remember, she's mine. I'm just lending her to you. 
here's your children, but remember they belong to me. I'm just lending them to you. And I'm keeping the dog. No. <laughs> if we want to know what God wants, he wants absolutely everything. I remember me and Neil was at a retreat once, and it was a retreat for young people. And there was probably about, I don't know, 100 young people there. And I was actually in a community at the time, and I had come back for this retreat. And all the way, we had set up this retreat. But all the way through the tree, I thought, there's something missing here. There's something missing. And, you know, the last person who got up to speak, he got up and he said to all these young people, he said, if you want to know what Jesus wants, he wants everything. He wants everything. But in exchange, he will give you everything. And I think that in our lives, we always battle with surrender. We always battle with letting go. I remember when I set up this community in Ireland, um, there was about nine people in this community, quite young people, and I felt that I was responsible for them, you know, because I had set it up, and so it had loads of pressure, and because of that, I was really stressed all the time, I was losing my temper all the time, and I was a lousy leader. And I remember I went into this church on this day and I was like praying to Jesus and I was just saying, Jesus, you need to sort out my community. <laughs> and I felt him say straight away, it's not yours, it's mine. And the mistake I was making is that it all depended on me. I had to run my life. I had to run their life. And the more he's allowed me, and I mean it is him who changes us, the more he's allowed me to let go, the more he's helped me to change and think everything doesn't depend on me, it depends on him, the more I've become free. And I don't think I've even began that journey of freedom, but I can say this, I've never felt so free and happy in my life, but I think there's oceans and oceans of more to find. But each day... Jesus is saying, surrender. You know, it's interesting. Last night we was having a dinner, and I said to uh, Val what I was there talking about today, and she said, well, I'm not coming. <laughs> 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 and I thought it's so true that, you know, well, as soon as Jesus says, give me everything, well, yeah, off, off we go. Because it's so hard, isn't it? And we're tugging with him. It's almost like we play tug of war with God. No, no, you can't take this. I need this. This is the only thing that's keeping me from like falling apart in my life. And the minute you actually let go, you realize how all it was doing was keeping you a prisoner. And it was never protecting you. It was actually imprisoning you. And the more we do that, the more God changes us. And just finally, before I invite Neil up to share his testimony, do you know there was a time where we was walking around to this school and there was about 200 boys, this is Northern Ireland, down Patrick. These are tough boys. And we're walking around to this school and Neil was a bit worried because he was in community, we're doing the whole day together. And he turned to me and he said, how do you think the days they'll go? And I looked at him and I said... Well, it's either there'll be a complete and utter disaster or it's there'll be one of the most profound miracles that has ever taken place. But if it's a complete and utter disaster, it's God's disaster. And if it's a complete and utter miracle, the best miracle of time, then it's God's miracle of time. Because all I'm doing is turning up. And do you know, Neil said to me later, that changed his life. He realized nothing depended on him. It all depended on God. It took me a long time to get there. And I need to be reminded every day, everything depends on God. And all I have to do is keep on saying yes and keep on turning up. So I'm just going to ask Neil to share his story. And then I'll say a few more words before we hear from Catherine. So good afternoon, everyone. And as John said, 
my name's Neil, so I'm just going to share really about how God has, has helped me in my life so much. I was born in London into an Irish Catholic family. And when I was a little boy, my mum used to bring me and my two brothers to Mass every Sunday. But I never understood what was going on in Mass. And so when I started in secondary school, literally none of my mates went to church of any form. My older two brothers didn't go anymore. My dad didn't go. And I thought to myself, why do I have to go? But if you ask me deep down in my heart, did I believe in God? At that time, I did. But at the age of 12, I stopped going to Mass. And as I started to get older, I remember there was a lot of problems at home. And my mum was a nurse, and she used to work night shifts. But my dad, he never used to come home at night. And you know when you're, you're quite young, then people think you don't realise what's happening. But you do. I used to go into their bedroom, I used to sit there, and I used to think, what's happening? And as I got older, that kind of emptiness turned to a real anger, especially against my dad. And all the time we used to get into fights together. And I ended up leaving school when I was 15 without any qualifications. Because my dad was a school teacher. So the thing that he wanted for me was to get an education. So I thought, if he wants that, I'm going to do the opposite. And you know, when I left school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But from a young age, the one thing that I really loved was football. I was a big football fan, and my favourite team was... No, not Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, <laughs> my favourite team was West Ham. I used to go to the matches every week, and, you know, I really loved it, because for me, I don't know if any of you ever been to a football match in England, but it's a little bit, more than a little bit like a worship service, isn't it? <laughs> And you have the people have their hands up in the air, but they're not singing to God. They're singing about some bloke who's getting paid two million quid a week <laughs> for doing nothing. And, you know, um, but I loved it because I felt part of something. And I actually felt like I belonged. And, you know, some of you might remember in England, this was in the 1980s, there was a really, really bad problem with, they called it hooliganism, like football violence. But for me, I wasn't really interested in that because I used to go to the matches. I just enjoyed the atmosphere. But I remember I went to an away match with two of my friends. I was about 15. We got off at the train station and we were walking towards the stadium. And then a big group of blokes, like grown men, came up to us, maybe 40 of them. And they said to us, you're West Ham, aren't you? And we said, yeah. And the next thing, they just started to beat us up. And I remember that we were all knocked unconscious and absolutely, I remember just hugging a lamppost and I, I woke up and they were gone, the guys were gone and there was a policeman helping me up and in front of my mates I, I tried to pretend that it was a big joke and I just dusted myself down. But deep in my heart I felt humiliated and I felt weak and I felt that I never ever wanted to be in that situation again. And I can remember going home and literally for about four or five days not going out of my house. And I started to shake and I felt so weak and I thought, I don't want this. And I remember from that point on, I had an anger in me that was, you know, it was just simmering all the time inside of me. And deep down, even though I didn't want to look at it or even admit it, there was so much fear in me. But I did something very stupid. I joined a gang that used to go to the West Ham matches. It was called the ICF, Intercity Firm. The only reason they went to the games was to get into fights with the opposing team supporters. And you know, it wasn't just a little bit of fun on a Saturday. Sometimes we wouldn't even see the football match and it was very organized and it was, it was very violent. But you know, for me, it became my identity. And I truly believe that all of us are searching for an identity. And for me, these guys, these older guys, I looked up to them and I would literally have done anything for them and it wouldn't have mattered to me. And if one of them was hurt, I would look upon it as me being hurt as well. And we were all the same in that. But you know, as the years went on, I began to realize that it wasn't really a pretty picture. You know, these people weren't good people. They would easily just steal money off people, if, even if they supported the same team. They would hurt people, they wouldn't care less. 
And it gradually began to dawn on me that this was wrong. And, but I was entrapped in it at that time. But when I was about 21, I remember, I'll never forget it, West Ham were playing against Arsenal. And I was outside Upton Park and we were all there, ready for the Arsenal sort of crew to arrive. And then there was a massive fight. And in front of me, somebody was really, really badly hurt. And I thought that the person was dying. And I remember I looked at them and for the first time in years, I felt a compassion and I felt physically sick. And I thought, what am I doing? Why am I involved in this? And you know, I stopped going to the football matches after that day. And I started to search for something deeper in my life. And I searched in all the wrong areas, but believe it or not, my best mate that I grew up with in London, he moved over to Australia and, and he married an Australian girl. So it was in the early 1990s, I came over to Australia and I spent some time with him. And I remember that it was the beginning of God beginning to speak to me in my life. And I went to stay with my uncle who lives in Brisbane. And my uncle is quite a strong Catholic. He's got a good faith. And I was staying at their house and I was way off the wall at that time. And, but the, they were a beautiful family. He was married to a Tongan woman. And I remember when I got there, they put flowers around my neck. And, you know, they were making me feel so loved. And I was sort of like one eyebrow sort of thing, you know. And, but it begins to melt you, doesn't it? You know, I thought to myself, these people are lovely. You know, and I felt at home. I couldn't deny it. But the, and every time that they sat down to eat, they prayed together. And they weren't afraid to speak about God. And I kind of kept there a bit embarrassed, you know, feeling like... But I'll never forget it. On the Sunday morning, the family were getting ready to go off to Mass. So I just closed the bedroom door and I just sat there. And I thought, we'll wait until they're gone, then I'll come down for breakfast. And, but all of a sudden, there's a little knock at the door. And I open the door and it's my little cousin. She's about seven years old, like really cute. And she just looks up at me and she says, she says, Neil, are you coming to Mass with us? And I said to her, no, I'm not. And I thought that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. She said to me, well, why not? <laughs> and, and I said to her, OK, well, she, she's asked for it. So I said, well, because I don't believe in God. And then she looked at me as if to say, are you stupid or what? <laughs> and she just walked off. But, you know, it really struck me. Because, you know, sometimes if you say, like, you, you spoke about a word from God... A word from God can come from anywhere, can't it? And, you know, the people don't realise it when they speak a word. But that was echoing in me. And I remember me and my mate decided we wanted to go away for a few days. And we drove up to uh, up the coast. But we ended up going to, you know, Fraser Island. And we, we bought our fishing rods because I love fishing. So we were fishing and everything. And, but that night we had, like, a campfire. And I remember just sitting there with my friend. And I looked up into the sky... I remember looking up at the stars and I felt really, really small. But it wasn't a bad small, it was a good small, if you know what I mean. I felt that God was there, like, for the first time in years. And it really spoke to me, you know. But then when I came back from that place, I was looking to travel again. Because I, I kept thinking, if I go somewhere else, maybe I can find God there. The only problem was, when I got there, I was still the same, you know. And I remember... I read, I was going to Thailand this time, this is my next trip, and you know those little books, they're like called A Rough Guide to the World, yeah, and I opened it up, and right at the beginning of it, there was a little proverb that said, you who wander from place to place aimlessly, until you realise that God exists within your own soul, then the world will be meaningless to you, and I don't know how that got in there, but, <laughs> it's not exactly making you travel, is it, but... I remember looking at it and it really hit me again. But, you know, about maybe a month after this, something happened to me that really changed my life forever. For the first time in my life, I became ill. And for two years, I was in and out of hospital. I couldn't hold down a job. And that fear that was in me, a terrible fear, became so overwhelming that sometimes I wouldn't even go outside my front door. And I remember literally physically shaking the whole day. And the worst part of it, and it's a typical bloke, but just trying to pretend that I was fine. You know, it, it, I think even if I'd said one thing to one person, it would have helped. But no, not a single person knew, but probably everyone knew, really. 
But you know, even all my mates, so-called mates that I was with, drifted away. And I remember one day, I honestly couldn't see a way forward. And, but I decided to ask someone for help. And the only person that I knew that I could trust was my mum. And I went round for my mum this day. And I started to speak to her. And literally, even before I got out, what I was saying, she just began to cry. And she just said to me, Neil, you've got to start to pray. You've got to ask God to help you. Otherwise, I can see that you're dying. And I remember it just hit me so deep because I knew that it was true. And I couldn't get what she said out of my heart. And then one day, I actually remember just sitting down beside the road. And, you know, I said the first prayer that I prayed since I was a little boy. And the only prayer I could remember was the Hail Mary. And I even laughed at myself that I could remember the words. And every day after that, I was saying, God, please show me what I'm supposed to do. And then one day I was searching through my bedroom where I grew up and I came across a little Bible that they gave to us for our first Holy Communion. Do you remember the little Gideon's Bibles? And I opened it up and the first thing that I saw was where I'd written my name in the childish handwriting of a seven-year-old. And I just couldn't stop crying. I, I literally didn't know what was happening to me. And the, you know, every day after that, I used to sneak this little Bible out and I'd read it. And I loved it. I kept reading it over and over again. And, you know, I, one particular thing, do you know when Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let him who believes in me drink and rivers of living water will flow up from within them. And I was thinking, what does all this mean? Anyway, this went on for a few months. But then one Sunday morning, it was actually Mother's Day, so I went round my mum's house and completely out of the blue, she said, Neil, would you like to come to Mass with me today? Now, I hadn't been to Mass for about 15 years, not even for a wedding or a funeral. And I never realised that my mum used to pray for me and my two brothers every single day. And I went back into the church with her, and I remember literally sitting down at the back of the church, and the priest got up to read the Gospel, and the Gospel was the story of the prodigal son. And... But then I remember at the end of the Mass, the priest said, there's someone here that would like to speak to you all today. And sure enough, it was John Pridmore. And John got up, and I didn't realise it, but the priest had said to John, you've got two minutes. So, <laughs> it's a lot of time. So John thought he had to do a sort of super quick uh, testimony. And, it was, and I still remember exactly what he said. He said, I'm someone that used to make the prodigal son look holy. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But, and then he said, this was the thing, and then he said, but six years ago I met a man who changed my life. And I can actually remember sitting back in my chair and thinking, I've got to meet this man who ever changed his life. Literally, it seemed to stop. And then he said, that man's name was Jesus Christ. And it was like, literally, someone had shot me in the heart with the truth. And I knew it was the truth without a shadow of doubt. And John invited all the young people there to a, like a retreat. And I never even spoke to him as I left the church. But I ended up going to this retreat. And I thought to myself, I'll go for 10 minutes and we'll see what it's like. And I can still remember I got there and I, I was feeling very uncomfortable because I felt really like the odd one out, you know. So I was literally about to go home. And then this bloke said to me, would you put up these posters for us and that. So anyway, the Lord kept me there one way or another. But I ended up doing something there that I hadn't done since before my first Holy Communion. And that was I went to confession. Now, I don't know what confession's like for all of you, but for me, I was terrified because I thought if I go into that priest and I really tell him what I've been up to for the last 20 years, what's he going to think? But in the end, I just walked up to him. I said, Father, I can't even remember how to go to confession. I've only been once in my life. And he just looked at me and he smiled and he said, don't be afraid. Just sit down close your eyes and tell God everything that you're sorry for. And I remember I just closed my eyes and I went all the way back through my life. And at the end of the confession, I opened my eyes and the priest was looking right at me and I could see no judgment in that man. The only thing I could see was the love and the mercy of God. And that was the first time in my life that I really knew that the Catholic priest is Jesus to us. 
in that beautiful sacrament. And you know, when I walked away from there, that terrible fear began to melt in my heart. It began to melt away because I knew that God was real. But even more importantly, I knew that he, no matter what we do, even though we get it wrong sometimes or even badly wrong like me, he never gives up on us. And he has got a beautiful plan for our lives. He can transform any situation. And I remember I didn't know what to do. In my heart, I wanted to do something for God, and I didn't feel like there was anything I could do. But I went up to John anyway, and I said to him, John, I don't want to go back to what I was doing before. And he just looked at me for a while. He says, well, then don't go back. He said, come with me. And that day, we traveled up from London to Manchester, and John was doing a school retreat for about 200 boys. And it was amazing. Like He was speaking his testimony. And I was thinking to myself, if only I'd heard this when I was their age. If only I'd really known that I belong to Christ, that I belong to him. And, and I was thinking, it's great. And then John stopped speaking. And he said, now Neil's going to speak to you. And I thought, am I? <laughs> Be careful of him. <laughs> you get you. And I... I remember, like, literally, as you can imagine, I said I, I didn't have any confidence. And it hadn't changed that day. I remember my knees literally shaking. But then when I stood up, the words came back to me of that song. You probably all know it. God's spirit is within my heart. He has called me and set me apart. And in one of the lines, don't worry what you are to say. Don't worry, because on that day, God's spirit will speak in your heart. And I remember then the fear just left me. I can't even remember what I said. It doesn't matter because I know that God is faithful and God has got a plan for us. You know, there's nothing impossible. There's a whole world of people out there and there's many people in this room that God wants to reach out to people that maybe think they're beyond the pale. And I remember I literally had a dream about six months ago and, you know, I was telling you about the football, but in this dream I was going to Upton Park and, uh, and, uh, and West Ham won in the dream. No, they weren't. There. <laughs> Not really. I'm only joking. They weren't playing. But in the dream, I walked into the football stadium, right? And I, I could hear the singing and everything. It reminded me. But when I walked into the stadium, it was absolutely packed. Even on the pitch, it was packed. But they weren't football supporters. They were people dressed up like soldiers, like warriors. But they weren't singing football songs. They were singing songs to God and they were praising God. And I knew what God was saying in it, that you know, every single person has been created by God, created to love him and to seek him and to serve him. And yeah, we can be taken off course, but if God can bring us back and he can use us to bring his kingdom and nothing is impossible for him. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that stops us from really surrendering to God and maybe giving our lives to God is fear. And there was a, a saint in um, Italy. Um, I always pray to him for my cars because he's Italian. So, <laughs> and I get some good cars. Um, saint Pedro Pio. And he said that fear is a greater evil than evil itself. Fear is a greater evil than evil itself. And I think fear just totally takes us away from every hope, every joy, every wonder that God wants us to reach and every wonder that God wants us to bring us. And, you know, one person I met, I, as you know, those who've heard my testimony, I was meant to work with some of the hardest men in London. And these guys were scared of their own shadow. You know, I wouldn't sit with my back to a door in a public place in case someone come in and shot me. And I walked into this uh, mass one day, and there in this wheelchair was this famous nun, and it was Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed with her, just being in her presence and just her speaking to us for about an hour afterwards, she had no fear, no fear at all. And, you know, when I reflected, why has this little nun got no fear? And do you know what I think it was? Pure love drives out all fear. Pure love drives out all fear. And the more we open our heart to the Holy Spirit, 
the more we open our heart to Jesus, the more we open our heart to the wonderful love of the Father, I really believe it transforms us and it transforms our hearts away from that fear to that courageousness. You know, I'm always really... There's a guy called... Um, what's his name? He's a French guy. Um, John, actually, he's Canadian, but he lives in France. Jean Vanier. And he says about... Um, the, don't you love the apostles? They're all so weak and stupid like us. And it's true. But once they receive the Holy Spirit... Look at the difference in them. You know, like St. Peter, I don't want to be uh, crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. Do you know, like just the incredible courage that transformed them through the Holy Spirit. And I think when we really open our heart to that Holy Spirit, when we really decide that I want God, I want what God created me for, I don't care what my life would be if I chose it. I want to choose the life that God's chose for me. Do you know, I was in America recently, and there was a guy who's a very wealthy man, and he's decided to give all his money to Christ. And, you know, I was talking to his teenage daughter. She was 18. And I said, what do you want to do with your life? You know, what, I know you're going to university. What are you studying for? And she said, I really don't know. And I said, have you asked God? And she said, no. And I said, well, why don't you ask God? He's created you. He knows exactly what's going to make you the most fulfilled and the most happy in your life. So why don't you really ask him? And she says, well, how do I ask him? And I say, well, <laughs> how do you ask anyone? Just say, Jesus what am I created for? What do you want me to do? And she said, but how will he answer? Will he just talk to me? I said, you'll know. Somewhere, if you keep on asking him, you'll know. Do you know she emailed me about six months later and she said, I know that God wants me to be a doctor. And I said, how do you know? And she said, I was watching a program. I'd been asking God over and over again and I was watching one of those silly soaps on the telly and I just knew in my heart this is my vocation, to be a doctor. And she said, I'm so excited. And, you know, I just think, how many young people are, you know, going to see the careers officer, going to see this person and that person, but the person who knows every single desire of their heart, every single dream that they've got, because he's put it there, they don't ask him. And even if they did ask him, would they be courageous enough to say, okay, well, I'm da do that. I'm not interested in what I want. I'm only interested in what you want. Because when you see that, then you meet a person who's da change the world. I really believe that. That if they're truly living what God wants us to live, then they're changing the world. Whether they know it or not, because maybe he doesn't want us to know it because our head would be too big. But they're still changing the world. So I'm just going to ask Catherine to share her story before we finish up. So good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Catherine. I'm from County Leash in Ireland. You can probably tell by my accent. <laughs> and we have some lovely Irish weather today as well, so <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, just going to share uh, my story, like... Uh, Neil did there. So for me, I um, grew up in a normal Catholic family in Ireland. We went to Mass every Sunday. We said our prayers most nights. But I never had a very deep relationship with God. I always felt he was way up there. And I called on him when I needed him. And um, I had a pretty normal childhood. When I was 16 years of age, my brother was in a very serious car accident. And I just remember my parents rushing to the local hospital and I didn't know what to do. My other brother was away. I was left home alone. So the only thing I could think to do was to take the rosary beads in my hand. And for the first time in my life, I prayed the full rosary on my own. And as soon as I started to pray the rosary, I just felt this deep peace come over me. And I knew that Our Lady was there with me and that she was going to look after my brother. And for two weeks, my brother lay critical 
in an intensive care unit in Dublin. And the doctors gave him very little hope of survival. They said if he does survive, he'll have severe brain injuries. But the likelihood of him surviving is going to be very, very slim. So where I'm from, it's just a small country area. And everyone knows everyone. So everyone was praying for my brother in the parish. Their mass has been said all the time for him. All the children in the local primary school were praying for him. And then our local priest came up to pray over my brother. And we had seen no sign of life in the past two weeks. But just as he was praying over my brother, my brother's eyelids just began to move. And all the time while he was praying with him, his eyelids just kept flickering. And as soon as he stopped praying with him, my brother's eyelids lay still again. But the very next day, my brother started to move and to get better. And thank God he's really well today. And I just knew it was through the intercession of Our Lady and Our Lord that my brother was healed. And um, even though that was so wonderful that it happened to me in my life, I went back to secondary school and I got caught up, caught up with all the usual things, exams, watching television, playing sports. And gradually and steadily, I stopped praying, I stopped talking to God. Not because I had any big idea in my head, well, I'm not going to talk to God anymore. It was just because I felt, well, I'm too busy and I'm getting on fine without him. So the next time that I really prayed was for my leave and cert exams or for your A-levels over here. And I was praying and praying for this particular amount of points in my leave and cert. If I had this idea of what I was going to do. And amazingly, I got the exact amount of points that I prayed for. <laughs> I don't recommend that to students, but I did study as well. <laughs> um, but um, it really just showed me that, that God cared for me and that he loved me and he was there for me, you know. And I suppose in all of our lives, he's shown us that in, in different ways, you know, through, through prayer. And um, I ended up doing something completely different. I didn't even, um, I decided to do, to do nursing. So I went up um, to Dublin, and like John was saying there, um, I really didn't know what to do in my life re with regards to career or anything like that. But at that point, my mom was saying to me, you know, pray and ask God for guidance, and I really felt that I was meant to go for nursing. And um, so when I went to college then, um, as I said, a very low self-esteem growing up, so I was always going out and drinking, getting drunk, trying to impress my friends. Um, I didn't like anything about myself. I didn't like the way I looked. I thought I was ugly. I didn't like my personality. I thought I was boring. I didn't like anything about myself. So I wanted to be someone else. And um, I suppose I was always just trying to impress my friends, trying to be someone else. And at that stage, um, it's just looking for love, I suppose, in a lot of different areas, and especially in relationships. And I got into a relationship at that time where I got quite hurt and quite used. And I realized that if someone really loves you, that they'll wait for you. And our sexuality is a beautiful gift not to be used or abused in any way. And um, my mom at that point, she had grown a lot stronger in her faith because of my brother's accident. Um, and she was always saying to me, you know, you know, go here, go there, you know. <laughs> Um, come on this retreat, that kind of a thing. And, you know, I was kind of pushing her away a lot. And then my brother, who was in the accident, he had been to a place called Medjugorje, where it said that Our Lady has been appearing for the past 34 years. And um, he came back home, and he got involved with a prayer group. And he ended up going on a youth retreat. And he was going on, encouraging me to try and get me to go on this youth retreat, to tell me how wonderful it was. But of course, I didn't really want to go. But eventually, he, he encouraged me to go. And um, for me, I suppose, when I went on the retreat, I was just so amazed to see so many other young people who were really strong in their faith, who really loved God, just normal young people. And I felt such a peace over the weekend. And it was really on the next retreat that I went on that I really came to know God's love for me in my life. And the priest on this retreat started speaking about God's forgiveness. And as I said last night, he said the words that Jesus said before he died. He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But deep in my heart, I just knew God was asking me to forgive. 
And I also knew, knew who was I to ask God for forgiveness if I wouldn't even forgive. So I ended up getting up the courage and going to confession. And I just confessed all that anger and hatred that was in my heart, but also all the things I had done in my life, the people who I'd hurt, especially in relationships, the things I had done I was very, very ashamed of. And literally, as I said, those things, it was like a stone been removed from my heart. I felt like a weight been lifted away. And I came away from confession just feeling like a new person, like I was walking on air. And I was crying because I was so overcome by God's love for me that in everything I'd done, he still loved me. And thank God, you know, um, I've been able to forgive, but I've also been able to forgive myself and to love myself and accept myself as I am, that I don't have to be anyone else. And um, I suppose the biggest thing um, that God is doing in my life is just trying to heal um, those areas maybe from the past where I have been wounded. And also to know that, you know, um, I remember a bishop saying to me one time, I think Mother Teresa said it, that, you know, God doesn't ask us to succeed. He just asks us to try. And um, I think that's been a big challenge, even just coming on this team and doing this work, you know, to have to stand up, to have to um, profess your faith, especially coming from Ireland where I suppose people very much worry about what their neighbours think of them. <laughs> and um, it is hard sometimes to stand up and to profess your faith, but... You really have to ask God for the grace and the courage that you need. And um, I know when I first came on the team, I was asked to stand up and give my testimony. And I was absolutely terrified. And uh, John and Neil just said, we'll ask Our Lady to help you. So I went over to her statue of Our Lady. And I just said, Our Blessed Mother, I can't do this. And I really just felt her wrap me in her mantle and just giving me the grace and the courage that I need to stand up um, and speak for her son. So um, I can't thank God enough for what he's done for me in my life. And I suppose the biggest area, as John was speaking about there, um, where I feel he's challenging me at the moment, is really just completely to surrender my life to him and to give everything to him and uh, to allow him to take control. So thank you. Yeah, I remember when I was um, going to pick up this debt for um, an underworld boss, and it was quite a big debt. It was about a hundred thousand uh, pounds, and I was told by this boss that if this guy didn't pay, then he would have to pay physically. In other words, I had to really hurt him, and I was dressed like very, very, um, you know, evilly to look as evil and as hard as possible, and I was carrying a gun, and I was going up in this lift on this sort of estate, you know, a council estate, real rough place. And as I'm going up in this lift, this little lad walked into the lift, and he must have been about 15. And I remember he looked at me right in my eyes. And on this sort of area, you didn't look at people in the eyes because that meant you wanted to fight. But he looked at me right in the eyes and he said, Jesus loves you. And I tell you, I nearly hit the back of the lift because I was so absolutely shocked by the courage of this kid. And I remember I got to the floor where this guy lived. And as I was walking out the lift, I turned to him and I said, well, I'm glad someone does. And, you know, I never went to that door. I walked down all the stairs. And when I got back, I said to the boss, he wasn't there. Now, I don't know. I truly believe that kid was real. I don't believe he was an angel. I believe he was real. And I believe he will never know how much grace he's brought to the kingdom of God until he gets there because he wasn't afraid. He felt the Holy Spirit say to him at that moment, speak, and he wasn't afraid. And I just think that when we do open our hearts, to that courageous grace of God where he really wants us to stand up for Jesus and stand up for the truth. When we say yes in every aspect of our lives, that's where we truly become his disciple. That's where we truly become a person who knows what it is to lay down their lives for the greatest gift on earth, the pearl of great price. So I know we'd be praying with people now. And one of the things I felt the Holy Spirit when I was praying for this talk last night saying that we should really bring to God 
in this time of prayer, any areas where we can't surrender, any areas where we feel afraid, any areas where we sort of hold on to what we think is keeping us safe, which is probably keeping us in prison. And I really feel the Holy Spirit wants to break those chains and set us free. So anyone who has any of those areas, please come forward to this time of prayer so that they might be really set free and have the courage and the grace to receive that pearl of great price and in exchange lay down your life for Jesus.